Hey there folks and welcome to an update on the geologic situation going on in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Friday, October 18th. It's about noon here, Mountain Daylight Time, 6 p.m. over in Iceland. And I decided to put together a new update because even though I just did a live stream a few days ago and we talked a bit about Iceland, there is a new uh, update from the Met Office, so I thought we would incorporate that, look at the latest data, and then to round things out here, I did uh, go through one of the recent papers that was published uh, looking at the magma storage system underneath this region, and I thought I'd share some of those insights with you. So thanks again for joining me. Thank you for your support of the channel. Make sure you like it and do all those good things. So you can see today uh, in or this evening in Iceland is a little cloudy, but a nice view there of uh, Grindavik on the webcam. Similarly, a view from the highway between the airport and Reykjavik looking to the south. Uh, this was obviously the area where we had the last eruption that began in August, but it's pretty quiet right now in Iceland, as you might surmise. Uh, so let's just jump right to the Met Office's update, which came out yesterday. Um, and there's some good detail here. I'm actually um, really pleased with the amount of not just detail, but explanation that was put into this update that came out yesterday. So props to them. So magma accumulation, as you might imagine, continues. The uplift is continuing. All the monitoring data and everything else continues to show that we have magma moving into the system. The ground is being uplifted. Um, and there's really no sign of this ending soon, even though we had all the uh, kind of um, interesting projections from other geologists earlier in the year that this thing was going to come to a, a stop or a halt by the end of summer. We are not seeing evidence for that right now. So current measurements based on what we're seeing with the data, Met Office is estimating about four to five weeks until we at least get into the window where a possible event is considered likely. So that would get us into, I guess, the last week or so of November, right around Thanksgiving time, if you celebrate that holiday here in the States. So that's the time frame we're looking at. Um, so that's when we enter, you know, the, the possibility of another event occurring. And that could go on, obviously, throughout December and the rest of the year. So hard to say exactly for right now. We've got to continue to monitor the data and see how things look. So GPS member measurements show the inflation continues at a similar rate. They talk about the warning time, which can be quite short, as little as 30 minutes or so. Not a lot of earthquakes, and their hazard assessment is pretty much the same. Um, so the progress of magma accumulation has remained unchanged. Uh, the uplift slowed down a little bit about one to two weeks ago, but has not diminished further. While the rate of uplift has diminished slightly, there's no indication that magma accumulation beneath Svartsingi has dropped. Uh, the fun little graphic they have here is for the Svartsingi GPS station. This has been the station I usually focus on because it seems to be most uh, centrally located to the center of the, the magma uplift and accumulation. So we just have our three simple plots here. And this goes back to last year. So this is nearly a year long, going back to at least December. And so each little step or each vertical red line you see there, those are the different eruptions, December 18th, January 14th, February 8th. The blue line was the intrusion that we had on March 2nd. The other blue line over here on the left side is the November 10th intrusion that kind of started this whole thing off. Uh, the March 16th eruption, May 29th, and then over here, our most recent eruption at August 22nd. So you can see the way each, um, at this station, the after the eruption, there's a, a pronounced northward movement in the station um, up until we get to this last one where there was a little bit of a southward movement. That might have been the location of the eruption that triggered that as much as anything. The east-west motion, mostly downward. So in this case, that would be westward motion of the GPS station. And then this is the one we look at the most often, and that's uplift. So uh, you can see the little dots trending up, reaching a point where the eruption occurs. Then there's down drop or deflation as magma is pushed to the surface and leaves the subsurface storage region. Then it starts building back up, then it drops. And with each successive eruption, we um, have the magma system accumulating to a higher elevation than previously. So it only took, you know, 300 or so millimeters of upward movement 
uh, for the December 18th eruption, but to get to, you know, the January 14th was actually pretty similar, but the February 8th eruption over here was a little bit higher, and then you can see each one being a little bit higher. So the idea here is with this last trend, we would expect this thing to at least need to reach this red dot here, uh, the highest point reached in the August 22nd eruption, and most likely it would need to be uh, some significant amount higher than that, and that's where our friend Bruce Garner's modeling comes into play and is helpful. Uh, back to the, off, the Met Office update. Um, experience of previous dike movements and eruptions help with estimating how much magma is needed. So the models are calculating it's going to take about 24 million cubic meters of magma. Um, well, that's what it was for August. That that's how much left the storage zone and erupted in August 22nd. And there's been a trend that the same amount or more magma than left during the last event is needed to the to each subsequent eruption. So we're going to need to store and have that influx of magma. We're going to need that same volume or most likely greater in order to see the next event occurring. Uh, and then they just spend a little bit of time here talking about how short this could be, that we could, the first signs are increases in earthquakes, uh, some rapid changes in ground deformation, and possibly these pressure changes in these boreholes near the power plant. Um, and that can be quite short interval between when we see the signals that the magma is moving to the surface and when the eruption actually takes place. For example, on August 22nd, it was only about 30 minutes or so. Um, anyway, so a nice little update. I thought they did a nice job with some explanations there. Looking at the earthquakes, of course, the earthquakes right now aren't going to be very helpful because we don't expect the earthquakes to be very insightful until the system is full. We're not generating earthquakes from the magma moving and filling the storage system because there's still space and it's not until we get to full capacity that we're going to see the magma starting to break the system is fully pressurized and that magma is looking for some weak spot or zone to propagate through to reach the surface that's when we're going to see the earthquakes being much more instructive in terms of where uh, the eruption might take place um, but nonetheless the last 24 hours in Iceland, pretty pretty typical, um, kind of the usual spots more or less. Looking at the last week, very similar trend. There was uh, a little, let's see, I think there was a 2.2 earthquake out here northeast of Askja. Um, yeah, and that was, you know, a little earthquake with some aftershocks over here. But again, nothing at all right now is indicative of magma moving its way to the surface in any sort of uh, meaningful way. Of course, we'll continue to watch all these volcanoes over time. Um, but, you know, a three, a magnitude three, even a four, uh, somewhere here in this system is not unheard of. It's when we see combinations of the seismicity, the ground deformation, other data, that things become a little bit more alarming and a little bit more meaningful. Uh, GPS data, similar to what we just saw there, um, but a quick look here at the latest GPS measurements from, oh, I picked the Edward system. Let's go to uh, Svartsengi, although they all show the same sort of thing. So there's our trend. Um, so the GPS data will continue to be insightful, but until we get to this, you know, about 160 millimeter mark on the uplift, until we get to there, which is probably many weeks out, as the Met Office said, probably like a month or so, um, probably not going to be a whole lot to watch there. So just some brief data there, and then I w thought I'd spend some time looking at this paper that just came out in uh, Journal of Science. This came out a few weeks ago. I mentioned it in one of the previous updates that I hadn't quite been able to digest it. Actually, a viewer sent it to me, so I was able to get this um, in full journal article. So appreciate helping me with the access to that. Um, let's see. Let's go through a couple things here. So these are typical science journal publications where you know your abstract the first section is sort of like uh, the problem introducing the region in terms of its geologic setting and then they get into their methods um, and talking a little bit about what they did and then it ends up at the end of the paper going over conclusions and stuff so it's a fairly short journal article I think it's only four or five pages which is nice and tidy um, but science we do tend to communicate in these very um, technical journal, technical writing kind of ways. So it can be very difficult for folks 
um, to understand everything that's going on here. So let me do my best to give you just sort of the gist of it, the, the Cliff Notes version, if you will, of this paper. So they basically, and there's a whole list of authors here, so shout out to all these great authors who put this together. Um, and basically what they did is they sampled lava from the first four eruptions of this most recent eruptive history. So the December 18th, January 14th, February 8th, and the March 16th eruptions. They took multiple samples from those eruptions. Now, some of those eruptions only lasted a few days. Others, like the March one, lasted several weeks. But they took multiple samples from different places around there, looking mainly at the geochemistry, because you're able to look at these fresh lava samples that you collect very soon after they've erupted. Those lava samples are, you know, you pour water on it, you quench it. You've probably seen videos that show that, how these samples are collected. And then I'm not, not a geochemist, but what they're able to do is look at the individual crystals and look at how those crystals grew and look at the chemistry a little bit and that gives them some good insights into how the magma evolved underground where it came from and then how it ascended to the surface so they're looking at these um, these geochemical signatures to tell them a little bit about the the magma system underground and what they found kind of cutting to the chase here uh, I digested most of this so you don't have to is that the system underground is there seems to be multiple magma reservoirs which kind of was in line with what I'd always kind of envisioned it wasn't just one big magma blob in the subsurface there's these magma sills which are more or less horizontal they might be connected by little vertical dikes think of like a sort of a lattice mesh network of magma bodies sometimes they intersect very uh, closely. Sometimes their connections might be more uh, tenuous and not so well established. But basically, here's some of the highlights here. So, so they found a different trend in the February eruption was a little bit different than the December, January, and March eruptions. Um, so here they say prior to the December and January eruptions, the magmas were likely isolated from each other. So they were in different magma storage zones until immediately before the eruption and then they were they were brought together they mixed but they were mixed on the way up towards the surface and then mixed incompletely either in one reservoir or during ascent uh, so they found that trend in the data and it, speaking of those same eruptions further suggests that they were not supplied from a single reservoir that was being homogenized with time so it's not like it was one reservoir that was kind of you know evening everything out in terms of its chemistry there was discrete separate reservoirs that only became mixed uh, very shortly before it all made its way to the surface with the february eruption they found a little bit different trend in the data where the february eruption was fed from a single almost homogeneous magma reservoir so this one does seem to be one body um, where the magma chemistry was more or less uniform throughout. And it suggests that magma mixing may have occurred in the days or weeks prior to the eruption. So we had much more time to mix those elements together, sort of smooth out and uh, homogenize the chemistry of the magma prior to the, the February eruption. Um, and then going on to the March eruption, the reemergence of heterogeneity at the beginning of the March eruption suggests either that homogenization did not affect the entire domain or melts of a distinct composition continue to arrive from deeper reservoirs. Uh, and so again, going back to more or less what we saw with those uh, prior ones there. Um, there was a minimum of two isolated, so together the observations from the four eruptions suggested a minimum of two isolated reservoirs, and possibly more than that, there could have been three, four, five, who knows, but at least two were present in the mid-crust beneath Svartsangi and were able to contribute magmas to the eruption near simultaneously. Um, and this demonstrates either that successive eruptions may not be derived from the same reservoirs or that the reservoirs are dynamic, i.e. they are not in a steady state. So to illustrate this, and then here's kind of the conclusion here, they talk about uh, other places where they've seen something like this, like in Hawaii and such. And then rounding it all out are some fun graphics and tables, but probably the most informative um, graphic is this one. So let me kind of walk you through this. So here's a cross section underneath this part of Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, the Fagradalsfjall eruptions appear to have come from a very deep source. So these are the 2021 to 2023 eruptions. These ones had a geochemical signature which 
indicated that they came from the deep parts of the crust right near the crust mantle boundary uh, ascended through the crust and then erupted so this was more um, homogenized material but much more um, primitive and just um, uh, not as evolved from a deeper source whereas when we come over here to the Svartsenghi system we've got these multiple sort of tiered lenses if you will of magma bodies or sills if you want to call them that and then over here what they show is sort of the three different periods so if in the December and January eruptions if you think of each one of these little colored yellow orange and red um, lenses here is a different magma body and they're not interconnected as much um, but when we trigger those eruptions in December and January there's two different what they call domains or magma reservoirs that are tapped and those two only have time to mix on the way up um, during the eruption so there's very limited amounts of time and interplay between the chemistries of these two magmas once they're connected until it all erupts at the surface. Um, in the February eruption, what they see something different where the, there was, this, in this case, the yellow one here and this red one, the two magmas were mixing much more intimately and you were getting um, a more homogenized material. So it was kind of a blend of the two magmas because there was some residence time of the magma down here uh, at that time and then when we do March and May we kind of go back to the same situation we had up here where we're tapping two discrete and separate magma bodies uh, and then those are getting blended only during the ascent as it all sort of comes up there so fun little um, explanation there of you know what they call these dynamic magma domains um, when they're saying domains they're talking about magma bodies these these separate magma storage zones so a fun paper um, one that you could readily read through and digest if you wanted to um, I didn't think it was for the most part too technical and heady although I'll admit I got a little uh, lost and bogged down in some of the methods when they deal with some of the geochemistry uh, petrology stuff which is not my forte so I sort of skim read that understood the beginning and definitely understand their conclusions and the outcomes there so anyway just a fun little uh, paper there I'll see if I can try to link it to the video description um, and see if that will come through otherwise I can I can get this to Amanda Joe and we can put this on the website so if you're interested in reading this we can put a copy of this on the website that may be the best way to access it so um, anyway that was it for today thanks for joining me for this uh, fairly brief update on the situation in Iceland we'll continue to monitor things of course as we get into November um, it could get a little more interesting at some point it will get more interesting for sure as this data uh, continues to come in and we start seeing some changes as this magma body reaches uh, capacity in the subsurface and we are looking at either an eruption or possibly some sort of underground intrusion. So thanks again for joining me. Hope you're well and we'll see you next time. Take care.